No, I don't need the government to run the economy. And there's nobody I want to run, no president, no elected official who I feel confident to run the economy because they lack the incentives to do it. The only people that can make economic decisions are people who are gonna benefit when they go well and people who are gonna hurt when they go poorly. Dare I say unfairness, inequities, I would like to see them be responded to with a doubling down of hard work, not a retreat from hard work. It's counterintuitive to me. So the former um, Union of Soviet Socialist Republic or the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. <laughs> Th those are our two options here. But if I were worried about AI, I would double down on the creation, development, and formation of virtue because it'll be the greatest job security you've ever seen. The celebration of Epiphany reveals to us the exchanging of gifts. The Magi, as we see in the Gospel records, bring Jesus gold, frankincense, and myrrh because these elements are more than first meets the eye. These elements are theological in nature because they speak to the way that redemptive history is arranged. Gold we see found in the Garden of Eden in Genesis. Frankincense is offered as an incense to Yahweh throughout the Old Testament scriptures. And when our Lord Jesus was buried, you'll recall in the Gospels that Nicodemus brings myrrh to adorn the body of Jesus and make his body a sweet-smelling savor to the Father. When Jesus ascended to the right hand of the Father in bodily form, Ephesians 4 tells us that he gave gifts to men. Man gives gifts to Jesus, and now Jesus gives gifts to men. And what kind of gifts does he give? He gives them gold, riches accomplished through labor. He gives them frankincense by making them into living sacrifices unto God. And he gives them myrrh to anoint them to be the ambassadors of truth in the world. And how we steward these gifts is as important as the gifts themselves. We dare not waste these blessings because these blessings actually shape our very humanity. And we cannot act in any way as if we are divorced from these gifts, grabbing a little here and there as needs arise. Our speaker this evening observes in his new book that, quote, what one has to offer in skill, innovation, resilience, exertion, sacrifice, and productivity is not magically abstracted from their personhood, it is a key component of it. Our personhood is connected to these epiphany gifts, and we need to know how to use our riches, how to use our lives, and our priesthood according to God's word. It's my privilege to introduce our Epiphany Lecturer for Providence Church this evening. Uh, Mr. David Bonson is the founder, managing partner, and the chief investment officer of the Bonson Group, a private wealth management firm managing over $5 billion in client assets. Now, David is a respected author of numerous books and the host of the Capital Record podcast, which I encourage you to subscribe to. The podcast serves as a, an apologia of capital markets and the free enterprise. And you can also watch him um, on a host of cable news media outlets speaking clearly and directly on a host of issues. It's a joy to serve with David as one of the fellows for the Center for Cultural Leadership. And even though I have heard David a few times, I have never ceased to be amazed at his precision and his wit and his capacity to distill big economic themes into layman's term. And he's here this evening on his new book tour with his wife, Jolene, who accompanies him. And it's an absolute delight to welcome this evening our Epiphany Lecturer, Mr. David Bonson. Thank you, my brother. Thank you. The most important thing when I come to a place as a visitor to speak is not just to turn the phone off, it is to start the timer. <laughs> This is a, a real privilege for me to be here. I'm very grateful for the invitation, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to speak on this subject. And as, as Pastor mentioned, I am uh, out and about with my wife, going to a lot of different cities, speaking on the subject of work. And although I am accustomed to speaking 
to audiences frequently, sometimes very large ones, sometimes very small ones, about matters of investment and finance. This book is unique for me in that I got the opportunity to write a book that molds together many of the topics I care most about that for too many people are understood as separate topics. And it's my view that there is a tremendous amount of integration that exists in the topics, but more importantly, an integration that needs to come into our minds, that we need to form an integration in how we understand a lot of these things. My life's calling, my passion, I am an unordained person. I am not a professional theologian. I do sometimes play one on TV, but it's a very low bar on TV, very low bar. But what I do is manage money for a living, and that involves bringing solutions to investors that meet their needs and objectives. So my business background, he, he said enough, I don't need to go too deeply into this, um, but we, we manage over $5 billion, and the people that we manage the money for are real people. They have real needs and goals in their life, and I do not believe an intellectual understanding of economics is separate from the application of matching solutions in people's lives. When you talk about finance, when you talk about a return on investment, when you talk about capital markets, there's a human element to this. I believe very few people on Wall Street understand that. Very few people um, have ever heard it articulated that way. But this process is the very foundation of economics. And what I mean by this is human beings acting around the reality of scarcity. That scarce resources require allocation. And so human beings do that. And they do that with a God-given reason, with a moral compass. They do so as embodied persons who nevertheless have an eternal destiny. And this is economics. And all of economics is rooted in the very basic verb work. Work is the human activity that meets our own needs by meeting the needs of others. Now, we could go meet our own needs. We could do our own hunting, our own procurement of water our own sustenance, but our very own survival, let alone thriving, took on an entirely different form when our economic activity, our work, went outside of our efforts and attempts to do it for ourselves. When we began doing things for others and they for us, lo and behold, two plus two did equal a lot more than four. Now, let me give a real life example that I shared in my daily economic commentary today that I just wrote about when I landed in Pensacola a few hours ago, uh, because I think this one may hit close to home for any of you in the room. I've, oh, by the way, I'm off script right now. I'm gonna do that a lot. And then you get to decide, was he better when he was off script or on script? And you can tell me and I'll take it to heart. Um, the book has been out for a little over a week, and already I've gotten a number of comments, and I sort of thought about it a little, but I didn't expect it. But there are people wondering why the book doesn't talk more to homemakers, housewives, and others that may be in a, call it, non-professional daily activity. And it's a very fair question, and I don't think that, the re that there is a real reason other than it wasn't just the subject of the book. It wasn't what I was writing the book about. It was intended in a more vocational and professional context. But I want to give an example uh, that just happens to be fresh in my daily uh, market writing that may hit close to home for some of you. In the, later, uh, in the latter portion of the 19th century, uh, the average American housewife made eight to 10 trips per day from their water well somewhere outside of their home into their home. And when things needed to be washed, it took an average of 50 gallons of water to both wash and uh, clean and rinse clothing. And through the course of a year, 3.6 trillion, um, excuse me, 3.6 tons of water uh, were, were carried by a housewife. 
from outside the home and not 20 feet outside the home, sometimes very long way outside the home. And so then you fast forward to where things started getting a little easier for housewives. They didn't have to carry 3.6 tons of water anymore. And what was it that helped facilitate some degree of modern convenience? Dishwashers, washing machines, other things like this. In the entire process, all we're talking about, all I just said was work. A housewife doing work in a way that was needed at the time, it became more efficient because someone worked to invent a dishwasher, a washing machine, and it brought together a higher quality of life, greater resources for people to still do work, do it more efficiently. And so that, to me, being described amorally, being described as if it has no moral repercussions, that there isn't a moral consequence to this approach to work and what comes out of that, the greater quality of life that is produced when someone invents a dishwasher, when a housewife is washing clothes. When we talk about these routine things that we can so take for granted, it has a tremendous moral implication. But all of it is a byproduct of economics. And this is why my day job working in finance and econ is really the important foundation to where I want to go in talking about this book. I believe that it is pivotally important that Christians understand when they're talking about economics. They are not merely talking about money. They're not merely talking about units of value, units of wealth. They're not talking about obscure formulas related to gross domestic product, but rather the activities of human beings that impact people's lives and do so with great moral importance. The um, reality is just to, anecdotally make my point about where capital comes in, is that when we pursue a return on investment as investors, all at once an investor is seeking to have their needs met and can only do it by financing the needs someone else has. In this case, the needs are of a producer looking to produce something. And that project can only be successful if the producer is meeting the needs of somebody else. A, a customer, a target market. The leverage, the scale involved in this beautiful economic process that God made and made it in the Garden of Eden, whereby we have needs met by meeting the needs of others. And this is where capital comes in. And I think Christians in, in, ignore that conversation to their own peril because you cannot have capitalism without capital markets. And so the return on investment feeds the meeting of needs, but fundamentally, again, every single thing I'm saying really can be reduced to the concept of work, to the activity of God-created human beings to do something, to make something, and in the case of a market economy, doing something that inevitably must meet human needs and wants, or nobody will pay you for it. If we get rid of this idea, if we lose the development and production of that which creates new goods and services, then we lose the service to humanity. So this economic process is my passion, understanding it, teaching it, appreciating it, yes, applying it and living it, but trying to actualize it in the lives of our clients. And through all this, through the investment dynamics, economic truth, and what I believe is a rich theology we're gonna talk about tonight, is this t thing called work that I want you to understand to be the verb of economics. But friends, I believe we are not living in a period where work is celebrated as that which builds culture, as that which builds civilization, as that which builds the kingdom of God. I do not believe we are living through a period where work is understood as that which enables us to serve humanity. And not just the way we serve our sick neighbor when we bring them dinner next door, but also serve people all over the world, maybe millions of them at once. Ones we have never met thousands of miles away. That's what work enables us to do when a factory worker is putting 
things together on an assembly line. They are serving people that do not live right next door to them, that may live in an entirely different community that benefits from their labor, from their productive activity. But no, work is not celebrated as an economic miracle or even the cultural miracle that it is. It is not recognized for the soul-giving, dignity-providing, purpose-creating vehicle that it is. It is not seen as the instrument of co-creation with God that it is, whereby God provided the raw material and mankind provides something else out of the raw material. God creates ex nihilo out of nothing. We cannot do that because he is God and we are not. But he made us as image bearers of him whereby we can create, we can build buildings, we can build schools, churches, institutions, can build technological devices. And I will ask you to go to bed tonight trying to think of something that we have ever built, including the iPhone, including the most popular, successful commercial products in human history that didn't come from the raw materials of God's creation because it doesn't exist. But no new raw materials have been created since creation. Everything we're doing now is a byproduct of a human ingenuity that is unique to mankind because unlike the good mountains and the good waters of the sea and the good stars of the sky and the good plants and the good animals, you and I are very good a special part of God's creation, with our specialness defined by him only in the context of our productive capacity to bear his image and cultivate and steward the earth, and to do so as individuals who have unique individual dignity, and to do so in a social and relational context, in families, in communities this absolutely triune beauty of God and his creation, one in many, miracle, theological miracle, but it's an economic miracle. And it's one I wish we understood better and talked about more. But as you can probably tell, I am not really here tonight to critique society at large's shortcomings in speaking about thinking about talking about work. There are other venues and other contexts where I'm doing that. There's a chapter in the book entirely devoted to what I believe is a monumental error on the parts of those who are concerned with today's rightly diagnosed epidemic of depression, anxiety, alienation. I believe that they have uh, rightly identified that people are not right and they have wrongly identified the solution that today in much of pop culture and in secular humanistic psychology, we are told that work is the cause of their problems. And I will propose to you that work is a solution to their problems, rightly understood in the proper theological framework. But no, my uh, reason for being here tonight is to speak about a category in which I think work is misunderstood, but it is in the context of the church. It is in the context of today, in the year 2024, how do I believe the Christian community is addressing the subject of work? And I believe this failure to see work as all these things I have tried to set it up as, this economic case I want to make, that the failure to see these things is fundamentally not a sociological error, though it is that. It is not fundamentally an economic error, though it is surely that. But at the core, it is a theological error rooted in an inability to see work in its creational context. That is to say, too often it is an error on the church, in the church that has not seen work as God intended it to be the purpose and meaning of our lives. So this has taken on various practical concerns in modern society. I'll just spend a minute 
with these sort of four basic categories. I am reasonably sympathetic to ideas around generational theory, that there, people often as embodied human beings are a part of a context in which they are raised. And so I understand the unique cultural generational different differentiations from the baby boomers to Gen X, to the millennials, Gen Y, and then to what is now referred to as Gen Z. And I just briefly want to suggest that you have four different age groups I just described, all adult age groups, that have four different manifestations of error or concern about work, each one of which is addressed in the book. The number one thing that concerns me about our baby boomer friends, and I want to be abundantly clear, I am not a baby boomer, and if you think I am, don't talk to me when we're signing books. <laughs> I'm years away from the demographic. I will turn 50 this year, and so I am smack dab in the middle of the most underrated generation that is Gen X. But baby boomers, what could my concern be about baby boomers? You hadn't had a generation that worked harder until boomers that oversaw the production of more goods and services, essentially the creation of more wealth, more material prosperity. I'm going to suggest that the concept of retirement and a 25-year vacation as the trophy for a good career is a tremendous error that is owned, that was created by the baby boomer generation. My own generation, the Gen Xers, I think are often made to feel guilty about what I will call halftime success. Now, I didn't actually call it that. I stole it from someone who literally called it that and then sold a million books and has now been used in 10,000 churches as the teaching program for small groups and men's groups and all these different things, talking to middle-aged men who've been successful, saying, okay, okay, that's great, you've done your career, but hold on, let's now parlay in the second half of your life your success into something significant, something spiritually meaningful. This to me is the problem that Gen Xers face, a rank dual, dualism that undermines the kingdom work. Not the, not the career work, the kingdom work they have done. The Gen Y millennials, forgive me, but they're a lost cause. There's nothing, <laughs> nothing I can say. No, I'm just kidding, sort of. Often, though, I would say it was the first generation that you could say systemically did struggle with an entitlement culture and mentality and was obsessed with something I'm going to criticize later called a work-life balance. And they were likely the most resentful of the idea of work and career as an integral part of an adult life. And then Gen Z, let's call it people that are maybe as old as 30 now, but in their late teen years and on into their 20s, starting college, starting careers post-college. Um, I have a big heart for this group. My, my wife and I at our company, we employ 63 people, and we love our Gen Zers, don't we, Joe? They are um, often unsure of themselves. They're often missionally confused. They're often mentorless, and they were trained to see work transactionally as something that can simply produce something meaningful, but isn't meaningful in and of itself. So these are the four generations, four different problems, and I think requires four different answers from our pulpits and from a holistic Christian theological perspective. So I will do what I recommend everyone do. When the time has come to find a theological perspective, I would go to the Bible. You can write that down if you want. I'm going to spend a good portion of time in the scripture tonight. I'm going to start with a quick quote. I think I am standing in a classical school from Dorothy Sayers. The church's approach to an intelligent carpenter is usually confined to exhorting him not to be drunk and disorderly in his leisure hours and to come to church on Sundays. What the church should be telling him is this, that the very first demand his religion makes upon him is that he should make good tables. I'm sorry, that's just beautiful. Nobody wants the carpenter in their church to be a drunk, to be disorderly, to skip church. But in the context of what she's talking about here, how many times are we preaching to people to be vocationally proficient? 
Well, where did I get the idea that this is important? I talked already about the idea that we were described by God. I'm only quoting the book of Genesis in chapter one as very good. The extra adverb given to mankind made imago Dei versus the beautiful creation he made, all of which was good, all of which he celebrated day by day in the creation account. But that was verses 1 through 25 in Genesis 1 that describe God's good creation. And it was verse 31, the end of the chapter, that describes mankind as very good. And in between, God said, I'm going to tell you exactly why. You are very good. I'm going to tell you exactly what the purpose of mankind is. In verses 26 through 28. Oh, I do love these verses. You all are familiar with the cultural mandate. God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female. He created them and blessed them and said to them, be fruitful Increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, and over every living creature that moves on the ground. God made us to rule over this earth, to subdue it, to cultivate it, to care for it. And in a couple of minutes, I'm going to tell you exactly what the language was that is used throughout the Bible, not merely in Genesis 1, Genesis 2, but in some cases, certain Hebrew words used hundreds of times. But I want to point something out here. It goes on into chapter 2, before the fall, before the moment of original sin. He said that he had created a garden and described a garden that had potential, and it was unfinished. He wanted mankind to finish the garden. The analogy to a painting that mankind is responsible to create, but to do so on a canvas that God created. I love that analogy. I think it's, it's a reasonably good one. But again, the inescapable verbiage is the verb to work, to take care of this. Every element of the creation mandate, the cultural mandate, involves work. And work is a transitive activity. So this is my fancy word alert. I'm with a smart congregation tonight. In some of the speeches I'm giving this week, it's not going to be a smart congregation. So then I don't have to do the same talk where I get into the depth of theological language I'm going to get into with you. But I have a high degree of confidence. But when I say the transitive activity, I want you to understand what I mean, because I think it is so profoundly important in the theological context here. It begins with a human subject, and that human subject is us, and it is directed towards an external object, and that external object is others. It is transitive. It moves through a process, and this is the work that God created. Uh, starting with us, the subject of work, to move to an object of work, serving some externality, and that externality is a human being with a soul that can never die. A holistic creational understanding of work reflects both the individual and the relational dynamic of the human person. The work reflects our individual meaning. This is subjective. In this transitive process, it starts with us, and we are unique. We are not all made the same. We have different skills, passions, interests. Some are poets, some are entertainers, some are financiers, some are entrepreneurs, some are teachers, some are builders, some are preachers, some are writers, some are inventors, some are engineers, and all are doing the work of the kingdom of God. And all start with their own subjective individual meaning that immediately builds inerrant social value, the objective. The movement from the subjective to the objective is the transitive process of work I refer to. Did the fall change things at the moment 
of sin did all of this change? Because all I've done so far in the brief exegesis so far is start Genesis 1 and get through the middle of Genesis 2. Did work become a curse? I want to read verses 16 through 19 of Genesis chapter 3. To the woman he said, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. With painful labor you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. But to Adam he said, because you listened to your wife and ate fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you. You will eat the plants of the field, but by the sweat of your brow you will eat your food until you return to the ground. Since from it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you will return. Is this passage establishing work as a curse? Well, work, no doubt, was impacted by sin, like all of creation. But what do we believe, for those of us who are theologically orthodox, that start our understanding of reality with the doctrine of creation, and immediately accept the doctrine of the fall, of original sin. What do we believe happens from there? We are living through the process of God redeeming a sinful world to himself. That at the moment of the uh, original sin began looking forward to the cross, and since the glorious moment of the resurrection, looks backward to the cross as our hope, and that like all of creation impacted by sin, work is included in the sin, but also included in the process of redemption. This is the entire message of the gospel. I'm going to read one, one more section from the book. The next step of our task hermeneutically, excuse me, is not just to see the parallels between these two curses, but to understand the very essence of Christian theology itself. God's intent for his world was severely impacted by sin, but it did not end there. The fundamental message of the Christian religion is that God redeems his people to himself. We know the gospel message is that he did this through the work of his son on the cross, where he paid the penalty for us all and conquered sin and death, through the glory of the resurrection. We live now through this redemptive process whereby God restores that which sin has torn down. He makes beauty from ashes and what was old becomes new again. Sin caused Adam and Eve to abuse their stewardship of God's creation. But Christ's redemptive work now calls us to a restored notion of stewardship. The notion announced in the garden at the very creation of the world on this side of glory, it is tainted by sin and subject to the curse, pain, toil, distress. All the while, it is being made new and perfect again through the process of redemption that we call history. This is what we are living through, a period of redemption and restoration that is the covenantal promise of God. We know from that passage I read the verses 17 through 19 did not call work a curse. And the reason we know it is because no one in their right mind believes that children are a curse from God. But you have no way to interpret that passage if you include verse 16. If you're going to call work in verses 17 through 19 a curse, then you have to call children a curse because that's where it started. It referred to the pains of childbirth, but not children themselves. It referred to the pains that come from the toils of the ground, but not the work itself. Both children and work were pre-fall. Very few things can we say that about. Pre-fall. Impacted by sin, but existed before sin. Being restored to the pre-sin, pre-Edenic conditions. I'm very excited about this, by the way. Work and worship, the Hebrew word avodah, repeated 400 times in the Hebrew scripture. Genesis chapter two, verse 15, the work in the garden, the word avodah, repeated again in the fourth commandment, Exodus, six days you shall work, 
no room for context around the work being ministry work or the type of worship we do outside of vocational work. It's the same word used, six days you shall work, to describe the work we do in the garden. And yet, time and time again, the translation into English from Avidah has to include, by context, the word worship. Work and worship, an interchangeable word in biblical Hebrew. We are to keep the garden, the Hebrew word shamar, exercise with great care to protect, to preserve, to diligently guide in the very Hebrew language in Genesis. In the interest of time, I'll move quickly, but parables that all of us are accustomed to reading, reading in the New Testament, almost all of them have a vocational context. Jesus is using examples of people in a vineyard that are building things, tilling. There is a certain, uh, the, the sower, you can go on and on. I have a list of them on page 86, but I'm trying to save some time. My point being the parables, the, these very famous, beautiful, pivotal passages to applied Christian living being done in a vocational context by our very Lord and Savior. And then the last bit of uh, exegesis I'll do, just to move us into the New Testament, for those of you not quite comfortable with my Old Testament <laughs> quotations tonight. I run into that kind of thing before. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. That we are created for good works. We are his workmanship, created for good works. What an easy passage to understand. Could not possibly have a professional or vocational context. Clearly, created for good work is a reference to being created to some form of generic charitable service. Caring for our neighbor, being loving to one another, all fair enough. I have no reason, by the way, to believe that the passage doesn't include that category of generic charitable service. But I do know that isn't the, past, the, the words Paul used. Ergois agathois, created for good work, is the exact Greek language for our jobs, for our vocational work, for that which we do, which is building culture, building civilization. Where did the idea come from in the church that there is some superior spiritual work and inferior physical work. It's an ancient heresy called Gnosticism. And born out of Gnosticism, because we don't use that word anymore, we don't talk about it, and I don't think a lot of us go about our lives day to day falling into Gnostic traps, certainly not self-consciously. But what Gnosticism did is give birth to a very, very ugly cousin called dualism a sacred secular distinction that does unfortunately permeate much of our thinking. Maybe even some of us at times, subconsciously, this pitting of the sacred versus the secular. When the church is not falling in a Gnostic trap and not explicitly preaching dualism, it is often defaulting to a pietistic explanation of work that we can, through our work, participate in soul saving, which is a wonderful thing to practice evangelism, and that we can practice putting family over a career, that the work becomes an instrument by which we do the really important thing, which is supporting our family. Now, I'm just gonna get this out of the way real quick. How many of you believe that I am anti-family? Raise your hand. <laughs> I brought my wife here as proof. <laughs> and both of my kids, no, 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 we have three kids. Three, okay. Okay. I knew we had three. Two boys and a girl, all right. I love my family as much as anybody can, I promise you. But the church's message is not a pro-family one when it is denigrating work and career in an attempt to promote family. It's a cop-out, it's pietistic, it's avoiding the real essence of the argument because there's real practical struggles that come up in day-to-day -day wisdom 
and to default to something that you emotionally leave somebody unable to answer by pitting the work against family. All you've done is avoid answering the question about the theology of work because you've put yourself in a trap. You've made a person who needs real life wisdom about balancing these challenges and understanding them and applying them and they're made to feel that there is priority one over priority two, and if you deny this construction, then you're anti-priority one. That's really what the church has done, at varying degrees, again, of self-consciousness, but it needs to stop. Finally, the church's approach, when it's not Gnostic, dualist, or pietistic, is utilitarian. That work is some important element of a means to an end to some externality, whether it be supporting the family, or helping support the tithes and offerings of the church or some other nonprofit organization. And yet, in every single thing I said, I want tithes and offerings to support the work of the church. I want faithful, generous giving to the other causes that we believe in, various nonprofits, kingdom building, mission building, institution building things. That work exists only to build those things up is rank dualism and it isn't true. The reason why someone cleans the beds in a hotel is because it is very important for hotels to have clean beds to offer their guests. Because that good and that service matters to God. Because it's a transitive activity whereby the subject of the work, that hotel worker, matters to God. And the person being served by that work, the customer in the hotel, matters to God. And that work being done from the subject to the object matters to God. And along the way, there is some financial compensation in a market economy. And perhaps there is money that is ending up to be used for other resources. Wonderful. But that is not the purpose of the work. The purpose of the work is the inerrant activity being done that matters to God. This is the biblical description the biblical narrative, and it is a mandate about work, a mandate that existed from the very Garden of Eden. Ambition should not be a word we apologize for. It should be a word we crave, seek, model, teach, and yearn for. We should do it as we do all things, in a biblically ordered way, yet without reservation. We must become workers who are not ashamed because we are made in the image of God. And our loving, powerful, and ambitious God expects nothing less of us, demands nothing less of us. We must work because God is a worker and he made us to work. Thank you very much. Thank you. We have some time for questions. If you just raise your hand, Pastor Stout will be happy to take the mic right to you for your question this evening. I hear Pastor Stout. Okay, I don't mean to get political right off the bat, but. Well, it sounds like you do. <laughs> <laughs> About 10 months ago, my wife and I went to Ben Carson over in uh, Northwest College in Niceville, and he made a statement about the economy and what's going on, and I uh, said, don't let anybody tell you that what's going on with the economy is cyclical. He said, this is different. He said, the people in Washington have no idea what, uh, how to run an economy. So with that idea, because Ben Carson was in Trump's administration, give me your assessment of how 2016 to 20. 20 went with uh, Trump, and did he make good moves? Uh, just, just your take on his economic decisions as we're approaching sure. 2024. Sure, I, I'm, I'm happy to answer it. I'm gonna answer it very directly, but I first wanna address something that I think was sort of a premise in the question, uh, and possibly Dr. Carson's comment about that Washington has no idea how to run an economy. Do any of you want Washington to run the economy? No. So is that what we're after? Is that the problem, that Washington doesn't know how to run the economy? 
Or can we put better people in Washington and they'll know how to run the economy? Did God at the Garden of Eden ask us to work and steward the earth or to find our betters and let them steward and cultivate the earth on our behalf because they're intellectually and morally superior to us? No, I don't need the government to run the economy. And there's nobody I want to run, no president, no elected official who I feel confident to run the economy because they lack the incentives to do it. The only people that can make economic decisions are people who are gonna benefit when they go well and people who are gonna hurt when they go poorly. And the only people who can make decisions are people that have local time and place circumstance. This is what Friedrich Hayek taught us about knowledge. It's dispersed broadly throughout a society. So the best decisions are the ones that are made most decentrally. So the idea of Washington running the economy is appalling to me but I don't think it's what we should want. And what we've done in uh, probably unintentional partisanship is set up this thing we can't get off, which is that when the guy we don't like's in office, he's hurting the economy. And when the guy we do like's in office, they're helping the economy. When you wanna know the truth, neither one of them are doing anything. On the margin, good policies help and bad policies hurt, on the margin. But what fundamentally moves the economy is human beings acting with the production of goods and services. So my question is, if I could wave a wand right now, and at some point I'm actually gonna answer your question. <laughs> if you gave me the choice right now for the economy, and I get to pick the next president, or I get to have the labor participation force go from 62.5% where it is to 70%. So I'm gonna get 7% of 166 million people back into the workforce. So just do round math, you call it somewhere between 10 and 15 million people are gonna go back to work, or I get to pick the president. Which one do you think I'm picking? I don't even think about it. Easiest decision I'll ever make. Honestly, the, um, Messianic understanding of the presidency in the context of the economy is a really big mistake. Now, to the extent that I freely acknowledge policies on the margin matter, I think what President Trump did in his corporate income tax legislation that Paul Ryan and Kevin Brady skillfully moved through Congress and that did get passed was a work of genius. To the extent we had a 35% corporate income rate before and we have a 21% rate now, and that we got about $1.6 trillion that had been repatriated. There were profits made by American companies offshore that stayed offshore, and they've come back into the States. I think that was a wonderfully productive supply side thing. I don't believe, and I have a lot of firsthand knowledge here, I'm trying to avoid talking out of turn. I don't believe President Trump is always super um, ideologically self-aware on these things. But these were, you have to give credit where it's due. And I believe that that particular piece of legislation was incredibly important. I think the decision to shut the economy down during COVID was an unmitigated disaster. And I think it appears right now that we're only gonna have two people running for president, both of which were in favor of shutting down the country. And so I'm, I'm, I'm disappointed by that. Um, but to the extent that on the margin, the president has some say in trying to promote various forms of legislation, then I think that there were some good things that came out of President Trump's term, and there were some things that I don't think were great. Um, you know, it, it, there's not often a presidency that I would say everything they've done economically is all bad or everything they've done economically is all good, and President Trump's would be no exception. But that corporate income tax deal was a very big deal, and that's where I would give him the most kudos. David, two questions, uh, real quickly. Uh, uh, Westminster Confession, uh, number one, purpose of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. You had said work was the purpose of man. So yeah. I'm curious how you worked that in. Yeah, I love, let, me, let me say that real quick. Because I, I, that's come up before, and I absolutely love the question because I'm a Westminster uh, catechism trained guy. I told you I'm turning 50, but I remember it like when I first learned it, which is when I was five. And yes, I believe from the bottom of my heart that man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. I just think that what I just said is work. Amen. <laughs> okay, and second quick question is, uh, you're talking, you said children uh, were in the garden. If the uh, only children were Adam and Eve themselves, because Cain and Abel come after. 
Well, no, no, but, whole, but to be very clear, what I said is that the um, institution of family was created pre-sin, and children were before sin, verses 1, 26 through 28. Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. The commandment to have kids was before sin. What exactly they were doing to be faithful to that commandment, I can no, not speak to right now. <laughs> On the subject of manipulation, uh, two quick questions and then a, a little bit longer question. Um, <laughs> it's, a, it's very short. Promise. Do you believe there's a looming commercial real estate default crisis? Do I believe there's a looming commercial real estate default crisis? No. Okay. Uh, because by definition, that requires it to be systemic. There will be defaults. It will not be a systemic crisis. Next question. Okay. Do you believe that there is currently a shortage of U.S. Treasury bond buyers? A shortage of treasury bond buyers, there most certainly is not a shortage of treasury bond buyers, obviously. We feel every single auction every single day. And why are rates going up? Well, rates have gone down from 5% to 4%. So at their peak, uh, about three months ago, they had 4.928%, which was a third of what they were when I was a kid. So they went up all the way to 4.92%, and they came down to 3.8% a month later. Today, they closed at 4.179%. I don't think that's a very high rate to loan the government your money for 10 years. So if you believe that the economy is going to grow about 2% and inflation is going to be about 2%, your opportunity cost to give the government your money for 10 years is 2%. I don't think that's a very high rate. But there is absolutely no shortage of buyers right now for our bonds. Banks, insurance companies, individual investors, grandmas, grandpas, everybody is buying it. And the central bank has been selling. They are down $1.2 trillion of treasury bonds in the last year. So could there be a time where there's a shortage of US treasury bonds? I suppose, but it has never come close to happening in my lifetime, despite a lot of false prophecy that it might. It's a very good question, thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you for your talk, sir. I'm curious if work is good, does it matter if it's in a side of the system that is ultimately bad, such as the USSR or the ATF or any heinous institutions? <laughs> the USSR was, so the former um, Union of Soviet Socialist Republic or the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. <laughs> Those are our two options here. Well, I believe that the, I believe that the context is very important. Um, we, we can look to the conditions and the context in which the New Testament apostles were working. We can work to the context in which some of our Old Testament fathers in the faith were serving in Egypt. And I don't know how you can answer the question any other way than no, it doesn't. If Joseph was to serve for Pharaoh, then um, the difference between Pharaoh and Yuri Andropov at the USSR was, I think Pharaoh was better at his job. <laughs> but um, I do not believe we should be sinning in our work. And I do not believe that that is the same thing as working in a context in which there are uh, unfortunate bosses above us. And I think the Bible is really quite clear about that. All right, these are getting good. Hi, do you think um, declaring for bankruptcy as a businessman is morally wrong? Well, we know, it, we can't say that it is morally wrong when the Bible itself is what gives people the ability to have debts discharged. So I wanna back up a little to the cultural context of the question. The idea of a uh, businessman declaring bankruptcy, it, it invites a little complexity because then we're making a distinction between personal debt and corporate debt. And that's a more modern concoction. And many would argue, and I'm pretty sympathetic to the view that it's a useful one, that a person not need to expose the um, assets of their household to go out and start a business. So we create a sort of legal protection around a, a company entity and that its assets can be seized by creditors in the event of an insolvency. And do I think that a businessman declaring bankruptcy of a, a company 
is morally wrong when they have the ability to work through it, then yes. And when they don't, when the business has failed, when the cash flows simply cannot allow the company to continue and so forth, then there, I don't think that there's any way biblically to make the argument that it's wrong when the Bible was what provided the basis for certain ethics around the discharge of debt. But the thing I wanna say is that most bankruptcies don't happen because the company as a going concern lost its customer base. Most bankruptcies happen because companies were over levered. So the thing that was wrong was not that you couldn't pay back the debt. What was wrong is that you took the excessive amount of debt. And so I think that there is a little bit more granularity or nuance in my answer, but as a black and white, no, but in generally, if you dig deep enough, you'll find in most bankruptcies, it is not merely that there was risk-taking and well-intentioned business endeavor that simply failed, but that does happen where I'm not gonna be able to look at it and adjudicate and say sin. But for the most part, I think usually you will find that there were people who made decisions that at some point in the chain of command involved sinful behavior. Really appreciate your talk, Greg. Um, Thank you. I wanted to talk about the cultural effects of um, When I've traveled in Asia, I've often noticed that they have a lot more hierarchy in the work structures. Um, for example, when my wife grew up in Bangkok, person that she knew across the road that all they did every day for their whole life was make custard cupcakes. These little cakes with stuff in them. They were the best in the world. Those people put their family in college with that. Mm -hmm. And yet, of course, the children didn't continue it because they went to college. Um, in our society, we don't have anything like that. There's no one doing small little things that don't cost very much, that don't require a lot of intelligence, but that make the culture all that much sweeter. How would you think that we could fix that here? So I want to acknowledge a part of your question in the sense that I do understand our desire for a certain sentimentality and for a, a um, something that seems very emotionally rewarding. I wouldn't disagree that there's something about that story that sounds very romantic and attractive and probably of cultural value. I don't know that I would agree that we don't have that in our society, that there is no sense in which there is still some degree of a small business and, and a non-scaled enterprise at a smaller level. I think we have it. I think it's more challenging in a market economy, um, but, but I would imagine that there is probably many more examples of it in our country than Asian countries, but we have so much complexity and so many bigger things. It's very hard to see an example of someone in our town who's built a successful cupcake co company or whatever the case may be, because we're so focused on who's gonna make the next one of these and so forth. But I don't believe it's true that we have only a focus on the big and impressive and complex and that we're ignoring or denying the small and the, and the neighborly and the, and, and, and the sentimental and, and, and nostalgic. But what I would say to you is this, what is a possibility that wouldn't make it worse? See, so often right now, I think we think of, I'll use an example of those that for a long time were very critical of a Walmart coming to town and there'd be a local hardware store or something that would end up um, suffering and, and you have to acknowledge that there are big and strong businesses and that there are small and not strong businesses that suffer in that dynamic. And other than the power of the state to come in and attempt to regulate away the big to protect the less competitive, which strikes me as a very unattractive solution, I'm not really sure. Now you say, well, I'm not looking for a state solution. I'm not looking for a regulatory solution. Um, I'm just looking for something from the culture where we're gonna like the small mom and pop cupcake or custard deal more. And then I think it's very difficult to tell human beings made in the image of God with individual subjective tastes and preferences what they're supposed to want. And I think that if people individually subjectively want the lady making the cupcake, I think that they're gonna really demand it. They're gonna pay for it. And in a lot of communities, they have it. And there's local homegrown. Look, my wife and I live in Manhattan and there's millions of people and there's all every single day, new restaurants, new big companies coming in. 
but there are steakhouses and bars and pubs and coffee shops and delis that have been there for decades, family owned, immigrants, gener multi-generational. So there's a little bit of everything in our dynamic economy. And so I just have a little less pessimistic outlook on it. But then to the point you're asking an ideological question, I'd be very careful about wanting the, and you didn't say this at all, I'm just saying I'm projecting. I would be very careful, careful about wanting the state to fix something that is just out of their purview. Yes, of course. Go to, go to the microphone. I was more going toward the effects of intelligence, like the natural ability of an individual. Um, because as my wife described them, this particular family would not have passed an SAT of any kind. Um, you know, they were very uneducated. So you're, oh, so you're worried I, I'm looking that- at, right, Like in America, we're the only country in the world that has people that don't work and are heavier than anyone else in the world. Yeah. We have a very unusual effect that way. And I think that with your comment on culture and work, yeah. we're missing out on something here in that we're not telling the people that are poor to go and do something like this, which would also enrich the culture. Instead, we allow them to have things for free and they sit around. Yeah, one of the things I'm very focused on in this book is that I believe the socioeconomic snobbery in, uh, in the way our workforce is perceived and talked about is a byproduct of a low theology of work, not a high theology of work. So I recognize freely, humbly, and gratefully the socioeconomic strata that my work and profession provides me. But I swear to you that my priority is not in defending exclusively corner office white collar professionals. My priority is a theological, creational understanding of work that applies to all sorts of different professions. And to the degree that that were to take hold, that preachers were to preach that, that congregants were to hear that, that the culture were to live that, you would get more artisanship, you'd get more craftsmanship, you'd get more skill. Now I understand the context of your question better. But hopefully my answer to the other question was good too. So, <laughs> so this is a very, uh specific question, put it this way. So, uh, group, do you have 403B um, funds that you have available? And uh, the reason I asked that question, the genesis of that is, our pastors are laboring constantly, and we need to take advantage of the tax code, and we need to have them to be able to build wealth. Um, so I just had a question on that specific. Yeah, so a four, he's asking if uh, a 403B can be done at my work and, and do churches need to do it. The first thing to say is, of course, but remember, it isn't true that a church has to do a 403B. Churches can do 401Ks just like IBM. If they want a retirement plan for a church that has a staff of more than one, then they can do it with any number of retirement plans that would meet that purpose. Uh, we, we, we do a lot of that, but a lot of different people do. Most financial services firms do. A 403B is one example. Um, it's more commonly used for schools but churches can use a 403B and, and they can use a 401K as well. Yeah. Yes, sir. sir, I'm George, I'm gonna talk uh, tonight. I've uh, got a question about the, uh, new, the coming AI revolution and its impact on work. Are you more optimistic or do you think it's coming to a point that you know, we need to maybe think about unplugging at some point? You know, what are your thoughts on that? Okay, so I promised my wife I'm gonna time my answer if this comes up. <laughs> Um, it's a great question, and it honestly is a question that has come up at every event I've done so far in the book, every one, and it will come up every single event I do. And in most media interviews, it comes up. And the reason is it's understandable. The conversation about AI has picked up substantially in the last two years, but the reality of a speed of digital computing that is performing functions that were previously unimaginable um, has been going on for quite some time. And so first, let me just give you the conclusion. I'm not even remotely concerned or scared, but I really want you to understand why. It isn't new. It's picked up in speed and it's picked up in public conversation. Generally, what this means is we're now going to go through a period where a whole lot of AI companies are about to go under and stocks are about to drop 99%. I was looking carefully during the Super Bowl for any AI commercials because those companies are all goners. Um, this is just the way these things go. And I'm a product of the 90s. I began professionally investing money in the 90s and all of those dot-com companies that went away. AI will go a lot of that path. But just like the internet, 
the, the existence of something we refer to as artificial intelligence will continue. And all it is is a logical extension of digital computing. It's a logical consequence of something that began before I was born in the early 1970s. And we created 51 million new jobs out of digital computing. Whatever we are able to use artificial intelligence for that will be constructive in the economy and society, and where, yes, there most certainly will be some jobs that get lost, displaced, and replaced, it will create different opportunities. And the only solution in the macro, me talking high level, so I'm not talking to a guy named Bill who's gonna lose his job, or a gal named Jenny who's gonna lose her job, I'm talking high level, macro, is we must facilitate a society of a dynamic labor force. High mobility, high dynamism. You don't want companies that can't fire employees. You don't want employees that can't quit companies. You don't want people handcuffed to a zip code. You don't want people that only know one thing and don't have the aptitude to learn another thing. You need people that are dynamic in a workforce. And it's almost like we've seen this movie before. The Industrial Revolution was nothing more than a slower version of the Digital Revolution. I happen to think that when they were inventing um, the steamboat engine and eventually a lot of the industrial technology that resulted in steel and oil and, and, and the railroads and the things that gave way to the 20th century, I happen to think some of those things were more productive than Snapchat. But be that as it may, the internet in all its glory has managed to enhance productivity to some degree. I think it's a bit overrated, but we certainly can get information quicker. But it created a lot more jobs than it lost, and AI will do the same thing. But here's the point of my answer. Jolene, I said two minutes, I've gone 314. <laughs> I can't do this in two minutes, honey, I'm sorry. <laughs> you can't lose your job when the employer wants above all else virtue. Because AI is not going to replace virtue. I will pay a premium for virtue. Most employers I know will pay a premium for virtue. That hard work, that resilience, that diligence, that sacrifice, that care for others, that empathy, that ability to serve, a computer can't do it. They can do a lot of things and they can do it all very quickly. And I don't take lightly that there will be displacement. But if I were worried about AI, I would double down on the creation, development, and formation of virtue, because it'll be the greatest job security you've ever seen. Thank you for being here tonight. Uh, we really appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, let, me, uh, let me just comment a little bit on the, our Gen Z years. I mean, they seem to be spending a larger portion of their income for a place to live, a car to drive, everything, really. I'm wondering, can you tie that to our low view of work in any way? And if not, maybe have some other thoughts that would be helpful to us. Well, I think you could go both ways with that because first let's just start with the facts of the matter that um, it's funny, you focused on the high cost of living and a high cost of car, but I would add the student, lo the student loan scam that really represents the biggest fraud as far as financial frauds go in world history because it wasn't just that people have this debt um, and they didn't get exactly what they thought they'd get out of it. They got the exact opposite. I think that they're less trained and less prepared for the workforce. I think that their experience um, set them back. And I think in a lot of cases, it, it reprogrammed their minds and their hearts, put them in a, the, the, my critique of the university system is so severe, I'll, I'll, I'll spend too much time on it. But do, do I think the general high cost of living has in fact in, in impacted the 26 year old's view of work? I struggle with this in the sense that the implication would be they're discouraged and disillusioned because the house is, they have a pretty good job and they're a pretty good skilled worker and yet they can't afford to buy a decent home. See, that to me is a cult of housing in our country that is totally unacceptable, and I'm infuriated by it. And I think Gen Zers that are employed and skillfully trained and ready and fiscally responsible and should otherwise be able to buy a home but can't because of the ludicrous cost of their homes, um, most of which their parents want to be high-priced and they want to be low-priced, 
See, everybody complains about inflation unless it's their home. Then they want inflation. But lest I be guilty of what the president of Harvard did, I didn't make that up. Milton Friedman said that in 1978. So I will not plagiarize. <laughs> People on inflation when it's their home, and I think it's totally unfair to Gen Zers when that price of those homes is being sustained artificially. But I do not understand responding to difficult life economic circumstances by saying I want to work less. To me, I would like to see the challenges, even, dare I say, unfairness, inequities, I would like to see them be responded to with a doubling down of hard work, not a retreat from hard work. It's counterintuitive to me. Good question. You mentioned that we live in a world of scarcity, um, and you just mentioned houses which have become a store of value as much as anything. Uh, the underlying you know, currency of our economy is people, but the thing that we are denominated in our work in is money. And so money has ceased to be a store of value for most people, and so they have to look to something like stocks or to houses. Uh, I was a missionary in Uruguay, and a lot of the family, the churches there can't afford to pay pastors because the currency has failed so many times. So what, what, do, you, what do you, when you think about that issue, you know, the thing that we're underlying and denominating our lives and our work in is fundamentally broken. What do you what do? You do? So I believe first we have to define what we're referring to. And so you said as a store of value, and I think a store of value requires a context. And when we use the word money, we know exactly what we mean through modern economics. It's a medium of exchange. So you wanted to possess a store of value in its function as a medium of exchange. And I do not believe money was ever invented to be the investment. It was to be the medium of exchange for the investment. So I do not define wealth, and you used a country example, Uruguay. We could use Uruguay, Argentina, Zimbabwe, anything you want. But one trillion units of a currency is not wealth. The sum goods and services that enhance quality of life is. So has America become wealthier or poorer? Just dramatically wealthier. We produce more goods and services than anybody. So an uh, ice cream cone used to cost 15 cents, now it costs $4. A person used to make 20 grand a year, now they make 80 grand a year. More or less, with various periods of these things becoming imbalanced, wages and cost have risen in proportion to one another. But the wealth that we would be investing in, the stocks, the value of our business, the, um, the activity of the economy, is defined by its ability to produce goods and services and enhance the quality of life for humanity. And our country's done that very well. And a dollar that is to serve as a medium of exchange should be a strong and stable unit of currency. What we have done is had periods where we maintained a certain soundness of our dollar in domestic spending relative to wages. And we've had periods where we've maintained a strong dollar relative to other global currencies. Like right the last few years, the dollar has performed extremely well relative to yen, relative to sterling pound, relative to euro, et cetera. And um, I believe people have to define the terms of what they're looking for. None of it is what I would exactly like to see, but I do not believe that the system is broken defined by your terms. I think the system's broken in another way, which is that we use a central bank to try to control the cycles of the economy. And it creates distortions, it creates booms, it creates bust, it attracts investment, it is what von Mises referred to as the misallocation of resources, a malinvestment. I think it makes people do dumb things, like buy pets.com in 1999, things like that. That would be my critique. I had a quick question on, if invention equals better quality of life, as you previously stated, um, at what point does technology destroy God's intention for man to work? If invention equals a better quality of life? Uh, yes, sir. Well, I, I, don't, I don't think invention um, equals a better quality of life without knowing what we're inventing and, and how it's being used. And so when we say that mankind created the wheel, 
I don't, I don't, I'm not aware of any Christians who believe that God created the wheel. I think most Christians believe God created the raw material and mankind came up with the idea of the wheel. And I think we changed the world when we did that. And we could go on through history. I used a few examples from industrial revolution, digital revolution, where these inventions clearly enhanced quality of life. But I think we've invented things along the way that have been destructive. And so like anything else in a sinful world, a relationship is amoral until you define it better. A husband-wife relationship is ordained by God, but there can be toxic or dysfunctional relationships. And an invention is amoral until it's better defined. Out of the, a, more, a mere material or atomistic context, an invention then has to be used for a particular purpose. And out of that, we find what it's, uh, first of all, economic value is, right? Uh, you can invent something that may not be immoral, but the customers just don't like it. Just watch what they're trying to do with these glasses, the, the digital glasses thing. Who wants to see a computer on the side of their temple with their glasses? It's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Customers don't care. They're spending like thousands of dollars. They want customers to spend $4,000 to get, like as if we don't have enough stupid devices all over, and they want to put them on the side of our pupils. So there's like an idea of a stupid invention, but I don't think it's immoral, but the market gets to adjudicate what they like and don't like. That's the beauty of the customer is they vote with their wallet and then producers respond to what consumers are telling them. But I think you're asking more about the moral quality of what's invented. And I would just simply say that I don't think an invention is net inherently moral or immoral. It has to do with what it is and what it's used for. David Bonson, thank all you. right, thank you all. Thanks so much, brother. Go to the table, and we'll be there okay. to sign you. Yep. I'll walk around now. Okay. Thank you. Our Father and our God, grant us your mercies, O Lord, for in the economy of the kingdom, all our gifts come from the hands of the one who has given us life and has created us in his very image. So strengthen us, O Lord, for we do not rely in the first Adam, but in the second Adam who gave his life for us and who brought the economy of heaven to earth. And today we rejoice in the one who rules and reigns in this world and in the world to come. For we pray this through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.